Welcome to our fourth in a series of four of conversations with the president of Animal Outlook, Erica Meyer, on the occasion of her transitioning out of the organization. So we wanted to talk, you know, talk a little bit of shop, go down memory lane a little bit and talk about some of her perspectives um, and memories about the organization's past, present, and maybe what things will look like in the future. And I hope that will be um, interesting and informative for anybody who's interested in these issues, whether they're advocates themselves or not. Um, I hope this will be a fun conversation. So this conversation is about undercover investigations, uh, which is sort of a high, high drama topic, a really kind of, you know, always, every time I hear people, you know, talking about this topic or they hear what it is that we do, they always kind of say, wow, you know, that's, it's really hard to watch. It's really, you know, these are really intense things. Um, and I think that's all kind of the point about why we spend some time on this and the, the difficulty and the stress that goes into doing these investigations because they really have such a huge potential for impact. Um, and they certainly have impacted a lot of people. So uh, if you haven't heard the first three conversations in this series, uh, go back and watch them. The first one was about uh, corporate engagement, and then we talked about veg outreach, and then we talked about legal advocacy, and now we're rounding it out with undercover investigations. So let's get started. The um, you know, you, a lot of people probably don't know this about you, even if they've heard about you or been familiar with the organization, but you actually have been into these factory farms and you actually spend some time in egg farms. So, so talk about that. Take us way back. And um, why did you do that? <laughs> what was it like? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, my background before joining the organization was as an animal control officer in D.C. So I did a lot of work enforcing cruelty codes in D.C. and rescuing sick and injured animals. Um, and I started volunteering with Compassion Over Killing, as we were then known. Um, and this style, so when I came on board, we were just, um, I mean, the, we switched the style of investigations that we did. And that also involved um, your input as well when you joined us in 2006. But when I started in 2005, we were still doing um, what is considered an open rescue style undercover investigation. And this is basically where you visit the farm when nobody else is there and you document what's happening. And in some cases you might even um, rescue some animals who need help and then use their stories to sort of highlight the horrors of these facilities. And so when I, before I even started, I was volunteering with the organization and I had without giving away details of how everything is done, been volunteering that included helping with some of these open rescue style investigations. And then when I joined the organization officially as an employee, I continued doing them. And in, in what you'll see in some of the old footage, or I don't know if we have some photos of it, um, you'll see me recording what's happening to egg laying hens. There are several battery cage style facilities, these massive egg factory farms in Maryland. And that's um, that's where we went inside and documented. And that was actually when we talked in the legal portion of this conversation, we talked about animal care certified mm -hmm. egg farms and how we had gone inside some farms that were certified by the egg industry as animal care certified and some farms that didn't have that claim. And those are some of the investigations that I was helping do and go inside these farms to document what was going on. Um, so the, the one thing that I remember most about these investigations is the stench. I mean, you can't mm -hmm. capture that on film, so it's really hard to convey, but it is such a powerful ammonia odor that even coming close to the shed, you start to smell it, but once you're inside and there are, you know, there's only so much ventilation that can really address these issues. And once you're inside, it just, it's almost like hitting a brick wall. You don't know what happened to you. And that's where these animals are living day in and day out. They never get to escape that. And I think that is something I will never forget. Yeah, that's something that every investigator, um, you know, you can, you can prepare people who've never been into these places ahead of time for that kind of thing. But it's absolutely shocking, overwhelming, just to be able to do something as basic as breathe going into these places. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I also want to set the stage a little bit for the time, the time period that this took place, because the, the 
movement had not really had investigations as it's, you know, as something people expected. Oh yeah, of course we're gonna get see footage that's inside factory farms and slaughterhouses. It just wasn't um, sort of a mainstream thing within the movement um, back then. And, you know, there's, there's good reason for that. I think these are very difficult, very dangerous um, situations. And also, you know, in terms of open rescues, there's legal issues there. And I think um, once the industry sort of woke up to the impact that these kinds of images could make, um, and videos could make, they really um, reacted in a way to try to, you know, shut it down using legal channels. And I think that's why, um, especially from our point of view, that's why we switched over to the employment-based investigations, which, you know, we take a lot of care to make sure we're staying within legal bounds. But I think that's a testament to the power of just something as simple as a photo um, or a short video showing this is the reality of what's inside these places. I mean, they're filthy. You can't convey the smell, but you certainly can get a sense of what's happening to these animals. They're on death's door, yeah. um, you know, and and really, I mean, you're getting as close as possible as a viewer without actually being in there to seeing what's actually happening in these places. So what did you take out of this in terms of the importance of going into these places, the importance of taking images out of these places? Um, and what kind of role you think it plays in change making? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the most important element of undercover investigations is the just the reality that these videos are uncovering what's really going on when the industry thinks nobody is watching. Mm -hmm. And consumers are just not allowed inside these facilities. And, you know, animal factory farms, big ag will use whatever excuse they want to prevent the public from coming inside. But the truth is they just don't want people to know what's happening to these animals. And that's why the power of investigations is still strong today because the, the way in which these animals are treated is so abusive that if those same um, the, if, if the same abuses were inflicted upon the dogs and cats whom so many of us have in our homes, it would result in, uh, in prosecution. And I think that's one of the distinctions when I was an animal control officer in, in DC versus working to protect farm animals. Um, I think that's one of the things that you just really start to realize the, the different way in which animals are treated in the legal system in the U.S. So, you know, for example, as an animal control officer, I remember having a case where there was a puppy who was um, tail docked at home. And uh, this is a procedure where they they cut the tail, part of the, the puppy's tail off, and it became very infected. And at some point we got involved and the case went to court because this was a procedure that can only be done by a veterinarian. And the person, you know, who did this um, didn't take any procedure, any care, any anesthesia, and there was an infection that wasn't getting treated. And so I remember that case going to court, but that is something that happens every single day on yeah. pig factory farms to piglets. Their tails are snipped off by, you know, without any pain relief by just any employee working there. It does not require a veterinary um, assistance in any way. And so you just start to see the different ways in which animals on factory farms are treated. And if like piglets are castrated without any pain relief whatsoever um, by employees who were just taught to do it with a knife. And you would never allow that to happen to a dog or cat that would be prosecuted if someone at home just tried to neuter their puppy or kitten. And so, you know, I think that was a big takeaway for me is the justice system is severely flawed. And there's a misconception. Most people, myself included, at some point mm -hmm. believed that these animals, these farm animals, must have some level of protections that would prevent something so cruel. And it just isn't the case. And that's what really started to fuel me when I came over to this organization was that drive for justice and, and exposing what's really happening to these animals in order to fight for change, in order to fight for their legal protection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting because whether they have protection is sort of a yes and no answer because in a way it's a question of are these laws going to be enforced are they going to be enforced against these the players who have control over the systematic issues right i mean these yeah. are these are cruelties that are entrenched whether that that is something the industry would come out and defend as normal or common is another question because I think the reality is as we go into these places more and more, we see just how common really egregious cruelty is, so-called egregious cruelty, as well as some of these, you know, commonly accepted 
practices. So it's a question of the role that investigations play, I think, both for enforcement of the laws that are on the books in the legal system, but also for broad social change and kind of getting the conversation going and getting people understanding of these issues. And I think at the end of the day, that's about the fact that investigations are why we are able to see what's happening inside these places. No one is going out there aside from a small you know, number of investigators um, with groups yeah. like ours um, who are going out to get these, these images and these videos because I think, as you say, most people would just expect, oh, these places are being inspected. Oh, there's a legal structure in place where someone's paying attention. And no, it's really just these investigations that play that role of paying attention. Right. Um, and, you know, I think to me, that's where like, you know, time and again, I've really, it really kind of comes up like, depending on whatever new thing I'm learning in a new investigation or whatever new legal issues coming up or something comes out in the news and it's like, well, actually, you know, you're you're not really seeing the picture until you see what's happening in these places. So, yeah. um, you know, you mentioned the piglet castration and the piglet tail docking. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Hawkeye, which was the investigation that we did in Iowa um, back in 2012, which um, I, you know, in, in my view, really highlighted just how horrific the conditions are, even when you don't have you know, kind of egregious, violent cruelty as part of that. And I remember, um, you know, you and I really kind of literally like pounding the pavement in terms of trying to get media attention around this and get the story told. And these images were so compelling. What What's the takeaway? What's What do you remember from that investigation? Yeah, I mean, I do remember the footage being really horrific. This was a facility in which pregnant pigs, mother pigs were being kept in gestation crates and then which is barely bigger than their bodies and then they're moved over to what are called farrowing crates which are just mm -hmm. slightly larger allowing them to lay down where they then give birth and feed their piglets and they basically can't move their entire lives there is so much immobilization and these are highly social and and intelligent animals and um, I just remember watching some footage of pigs being moved from the gestation crate to the farrowing crates, and they could barely walk. Um, they just, there it was just misery on their faces. I mean, it, it's hard to even really describe um, the misery that they must be enduring through this immobilization, and there's like no stimulation. It's just inside this massive warehouse. And then they give birth to all of these piglets who are tortured in front of them. They're mutilated with the castration, with the you know, teeth clipping, with the tail docking and the ear trimming and all these you know, mutilations performed on these young piglets in front of their mothers. And then not long after that, they're taken away from their mothers who are then re-impregnated. So it's just this horrible cycle. But the thing that really I also remember about Hawkeye is that's when Iowa was, um, in the process of passing an ad gag bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we really came in on that tail end of um, having the ability to do an undercover investigation before the industry came in and started criminalizing through what are known as ad gag bills, started criminalizing the act of exposing the abuses inside these massive factory farms. Yeah, and that's, that's a battle that's going on to this day. So for a number of years that did shut out mm -hmm. investigations and you know, there's sort of some hope with some victories on that on the legal front, but then, you know, you take a step back with some new bill. I mean, it, there are things that I think the industry realizes, especially in Iowa, because it's such a, a big ag state and particularly in the pork industry. Yeah. Um, that, you know, these are, th the Hawkeye was such a good example of this. These are things that the industry needs to continue its business model, right? Like the, if they were exposed doing things you know, it doesn't matter how kind of, you know, shiny and nice and you know, they make it look like the reality is if certain practices here are exposed, um, you know, I think they, they realize that people would not accept that. And, and that means just the basic truth of it um, is so potentially damaging to them that they had to actually criminalize the exposure yeah. of that truth. I will say with Hawkeye, you know, the other thing that really sticks with me, I just, every time we do an investigation, there's something new for me. Like, I feel like we kind of know what we're going to see, but in that investigation, I had no idea 
that, you know, one of the practices in the pork industry is to take the intestines of the dead piglets and feed them back to the pigs. Like, you know, that yeah. there's such a sort of a horror movie level of, you know, thinking that goes into that. And, you know, we've dug into some of the reasons why did that even come about and the science on it seems very shaky, um, you know, but even just the basic fact of that, um, you know, we had no idea we were going to run into something like that. And I think that's where like thinking about what was happening at, you know, around 2012 in Iowa, you know, there was such an interesting kind of tug of war between who got the podium to be able to sort of tell the story about these animals. Um, and I think, you know, without an investigations like this, I don't think this would ever have even come on the radar. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that hi helps to highlight the importance of these undercover investigations is, you know, what happens behind these closed doors is unknown to the public and unknown for a reason. The industry doesn't want us to know. So we made it our job to pull back that curtain and reveal what's really going on and bring that footage to consumers since consumers aren't allowed to go inside. So that's, yeah. that's our mission is to expose that truth. Yeah. And, you know, just the contrast between Hawkeye and the next one we'll talk about. So I remember, like I said, kind of pounding the pavement where we were, we were, I was like going to, I think Kinko's was still in business at the time. I was, you know, photocopying things to try to give them to reporters and stuff. And we were really pushing to get some media coverage of it. Um, you know, and, and we were in whole, Iowa for a press conference. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we we kind of did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, everybody showed up with their lights and their cameras and stuff. And we were like, okay, I mean, you know, we're going to yeah. get something in at least local media. And that was, you know, sort of a big deal. And then we fast forward to later in 2012 when we have the Central Valley meat investigation. Um, and I think that investigation, I mean, to me, actually, that one probably is the one that I think about the most to this day, just because of how much cruelty and abuse and violence was in that investigation and how much raw footage I kind of sat and watched these animals go to their deaths over and over again and kind of got to the point where I was thinking like not as much about the, about the violence. I had that kind of like transcendent sort of out of body experience of like, what are we doing here as a species, right? Like, why are we letting these, these very gentle, very sweet animals, you know, um, just, all day long, in and out, all day long, just, you know, be, be killed. And what is the point of this kind of thing? Um, you know, and I, I think there is something really powerful about that investigation just sort of inherently, although I don't think any other given investigation, you know, is materially different, right? I think what was different about this investigation is it was the moment culturally, I think, when people were ready to hear about it and the media on that investigation became such a huge thing and really, I think, um, changed the expectations that we had about what the potential reach was of any given investigation. So do you remember yeah. how that came about and kind of what you were thinking at the time? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, so Central Valley Meat is a, a slaughterhouse that slaughters um, what are known as spent dairy cows. These are dairy cows who've, you know, aren't profiting the dairy industry anymore. So they send them off to a slaughterhouse and that meat is usually used in like cheap ground beef, um, like hamburgers at a fast food restaurant. And so what we're, you know, what we're documenting in this investigation is these very um, sort of weakened, um, older, they're not even old, they're like five years old, which is not old mm -hmm. for a cow, but it's old in the dairy industry. And so they're, you know, they're just suffering from different ailments and injuries. And uh, they are, the, the whole slaughter process is just absolutely horrific from, you know, missing um, the, the, the process of, of the bolt gun in their head, which mm -hmm. is supposed to render them unconscious. I mean, even that alone is horrific to watch, but then when they don't get it right and the cow is still alive after that, and, you know, they're making all these vocalizations because they're in such pain and agony and there's so much fear and, I mean, it's just a really hard video to watch. And it wasn't that long after um, the Hallmark case, which that was an HSUS investigation that resulted in this massive meat recall because of um, the possibility, or I don't know if there was proof of, but there was a downed cow that ended up through, possibly going through the um, processing system and ended up in the food chain. That really piqued a lot of media interest just in an 
of itself. But the USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, um, we did submit our evidence to, to the USDA and they jumped on it because of mm -hmm. that fear that it could be another Hallmark case. Um, and so they decided to step in and temporarily shut the slaughterhouse down. And we had already been in touch with ABC Nightly News about this. And then we found out, I remember, um, we didn't know if the USDA was gonna do anything. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we never expect them to do anything. So I think we sort of had that same expectation of they should, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And we, I think, had heard from a very local um, newspaper in um, the city where, or the area where Central Valley Meat Slaughterhouse is located, that workers went to work that day, it was a Monday or Tuesday, they went to work that day and they were told to go home. And somehow yeah. we got word of this and then figured out the USDA was sending everybody home. The USDA had temporarily shut them down and that's when you know ABC Nightly News really wanted to, to run with this story. And um, that's where the, all the media coverage began was that yeah, it became one of the largest news stories of anything about anything for that whole week. And yeah. there was, you know, like interview after out. interview, footage yeah. requests. They wanted more information. It was just, you know, this barrage. And then we we were able to link the slaughterhouse with In and Out Burger. So we reached out to In and Out Burger, and they dropped that company as a supplier. It brought in talks of offering veggie burgers, which they're still, I think, one of the few fast food places that isn't offering yeah. any, any kind of a veggie patty. So we might have to reach back out to them. But um, it just launched so many different types of conversations and, and potential for change within the system, within the corporate structures of, you know, who's where your meat is coming from and, and how are we treating these animals? Yeah, I think, uh what's so interesting just sort of a unique element of the way the dairy industry is structured is there aren't all that many spent dairy cow slaughterhouses yeah so this happened to be a major one it's not even the biggest one um but when you know you have exposure of what's happening in a slaughterhouse like this you're likely then to have suppliers you know or they are supplying pretty much every fast food place you can think of um, and in this case also was supplying the federal government, the national school lunch program. I mean, they're just, they these, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. the media started helping us uncover some of the fast food chains. Yeah. yeah. I remember pulling an old, um, opinion from a lawsuit from many years prior that listed out certain fast food chains and we're like, well, are they still supplying to those? But I mean, the reality is there's only a handful of these places out there and these are hubs of these huge amounts of meat that's coming out of, and it's the cheap meat. And that's where, you know, hamburger comes from, right? The ground beef. So anybody who is a big consumer of, of cheap meat, like all these fast food chains, government, yeah. um, you know, they're, they are all kind of interconnected with these few places. And I was really surprised at the time that, um, yes, that, that USDA got itself, involved because you know that was something that we didn't necessarily expect would happen mm -hmm. um but we had asked for over a hundred we thought there were over a hundred instances that merited enforcement and there were four things that they listed on their enforcement letter and they completely excluded what you talked about before which was the what we said was improper stunning so i really i always think about that one clip from that investigation where there was a cow that had been stunned and was looking right into the camera and you know bleeding and breathing and the the worker got blood on his shoe and he went off to get a paper towel and so we're just sitting there watching this cow um you know for for a long time like i mean every second in a situation like that you know is, is feels really really excruciating and i just remember thinking i can't believe you know that this didn't do anything for them like how could a person yeah. watch footage like that and not do anything about it and on the other hand it was a big groundbreaking thing that they did, you know, that enforcement, they did temporarily suspend operations. And I think that was because they wanted to investigate the issue of whether there are food safety issues. So that seemed to be the way that this topic kind of got itself on the national stage. But it was nice, I thought that that opened the doors, at least in my mind for, okay, well, next time we do an investigation and we have compelling footage, um, you know, which yeah. <laughs> that, that's not the hard part, right? We can get compelling footage everywhere we go. Um, maybe there's a way to get a national kind of story about it. So let's let's jump into Kwana on that front. 
um, which I think both did get ourselves some some national exposure, but also, um, you know, the ag gag sort of war was was heating up there, and, yeah. and that, you know, a big moment there. Yeah, I mean, so Quanta Cattle Company is in um, is in Colorado, and our investigator worked there. Um, it was a you know with a with a hidden camera, and mm -hmm. while she was working there, what she was documenting was it's a, it was sort of an odd facility that we weren't that familiar with. It's a type of place that takes these unwanted dairy cows calves from a mm -hmm. dairy farm, holds they take them, they load them up on a truck, take them to this dairy calf holding facility for maybe a few weeks. Um, and then they ship them out to another grow out farm where they might be raised for veal, they might be raised probably mm -hmm. for um, for meat. And so it was just sort of this short span of their lives. Um, and these, I mean, they're newborn, they're newborn mm -hmm. calves, they can't really walk yet. And so our investigator documented just the way in which these animals are being um, loaded and unloaded on the trucks. They're being thrown and kicked and pulled and yanked by their tails and pulled by their ears. And, you know, just just these horrible ways to treat these, you know, newborn animals. And, you know, what was interesting about that case is she's documenting all of this cruelty. And we turn the evidence over to local authorities. And then she, our investigator, is charged with animal cruelty. And they process her and take a mugshot of her. And that's the crime. The crime through all of this that we've documented, all these you know, horrific ways in which these baby cows are being treated. And the crime is our investigators is charged with animal cruelty. Um, that is, you know, that really, that's, it's an unfortunate situation that that's the route they decided to take, but it did sort of backfire in the sense that it helped garner even more attention on what was happening inside that facility than we may have otherwise gotten. Um, so it really, you know, lifted this platform, not just of how we're treating animals, how we don't know how we're treating animals on these farms, to how the industry is so desperately trying to hide what's happening they're now actively charging. There's no ad gag law in Colorado, but they're now actively enforcing this non-existent ad gag law by trying to criminalize what she did um, by charging her with cruelty to animals. And that um, the case, we had defense attorneys in Colorado volunteer to take the case because they knew that it wouldn't stand up. Um, and eventually that charge was dropped. Yeah, well, you know, very, very traumatic and, and in terms of the experience of our investigator yeah. um, and, you know, what, you know, what next steps we needed to take um, to ensure that she was safe and also that we still were able to do something about how these animals are being treated, put the focus back on these, these calves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember really the, the kind of big thing for me was above all else, I wanted to do, you know, what, what we could to kind of protect the investigators. So the investigators are always going out and kind of, you know, really putting themselves out there, really kind of taking physical and emotional risks. And the idea that this would be just such a completely outside of the law, kind of interpretation of the law, um, that we there's no way we could have predicted. Um, and then just sort of thinking, okay, well, what can we do to really make sure that this is kind of righted, that the, that there, it's clear what the justice is. I mean, the, the what they were doing just as a little context. So what they said was she had, broken the cruelty law because she didn't immediately report the after the first instance that she witnessed well that is a form of ag gag law so oh hi kitty um, <laughs> so that is a form of ag gag law at the time there were different versions of what we would consider to be ag gag laws and one of ones that was sort of trendy floating around different states was the idea that you know there would be a it, it was sort of an ag gag law in disguise, like it was, you would um, have a mandatory reporting requirement and the function of that, you know, within 24 hours or 48 hours, or whatever, the function of that was to make sure that the investigation couldn't be completed, right? Like whatever you're getting in the first day or two is certainly yeah. not a full picture of the whole system of cruelty, which is of course the target of these investigations is figuring out what actually is going on. Now, of course, if we were to walk in and 
you know, there wasn't any cruelty, <laughs> it would be a different story. But it's like, we know that when we go to these places, that's what we can expect to see is, you know, a real systematic problem, um, kind of up and down the chain in terms of the hierarchy of how the place is structured. And these laws were in place to stop that. So what this charge was meant to do was to, as you say, enforce a non-existing ag law. There was a bill floating around. They kind of read it that way into the law to, you know, kind of kick up some dust and get some attention on this issue. Yeah. Um, now, what I thought was so interesting in, you know, talking with the investigator after the fact and, and kind of um, even years later, like this is sort of what sticks with it is they, the the sheriff's department actually put a press release out with her picture and put it on their Facebook page. And they they sent it out to all these news outlets and stuff. Which yeah, over a hundred, I think it was over a hundred media outlets got her mugshot. Which we only knew because they did not BCC the list. <laughs> right. Um, but um, they did not do the same publicity for the actual people that they charged who were engaged in cruelty. So this was all to kind of get the attention on her and it had the effect of ending her investigative career. But, you know, what was really great, as you mentioned, this, you know, really fantastic defense attorney kind of came out, jumped on the news too, and said, look, this is absolutely crazy way of interpreting the law. Certainly she did not yeah. commit animal cruelty. <laughs> um, you know, that was borne out legally, but um, she also won two awards, including the whistleblower of the year award as part yeah. of it. And the story was on CNN. Um, you know, we were able to kind of get that that out there. And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, sort of the lesson of, of that story really is these are, this is a, a battle over who gets to speak on these issues, you know, and who gets to have credibility. And the, the sort of overt attempt to destroy her credibility was just so you know, sort of frustrating, yeah. but turned out, turned out well in the end. Yeah. And I, I know, I think, you know, the bigger picture of that too was uh, intended as a chilling effect to other investigators out yeah. there, not just her, not just to stop her, which he effectively did end her investigation career. She's still doing amazing animal advocacy work, but um, it's, I think it was to send a message to other yeah. individuals and organizations. It's a, that chilling effect of, of, you know, if you do investigations, this is what could happen to you. Um, yeah. But the whole thing backfired. Yeah, I, think, I mean, so that was really kind of in the thick of it with with ag gag, and I think yeah. um, you know we're in a different place now in terms of ag gag. Like, thankfully, and you know, through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, I think the the movement and you know has has really been successful in a lot of these legal challenges. But um, it doesn't mean that the fight has gone away. I think there's still really this battle over who gets to see what's happening. Um, and there, you know, the, we really can't take for granted our kind of right to see what's ha what's happening in these industries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, the ag -AG, um, initiatives, the bills and efforts across the country, I think it's just so interesting that, you know, these, the, some of these have existed for quite a while, but others have more recently popped up or they had been popping up as a sort of a way to combat the growing number of investigations across the country and the impact. Um, it's really about the impact that these investigations are having. And, you know, I think it was just an interesting response that the industry, while being exposed for all this horrific cruelty that is just shocking the public, Mm -hmm. and reaching media outlets, um, their response was to, instead of addressing the abuses that are being uncovered, is to prevent people from ever seeing them in the first place. That, yeah, yeah. The, to them, the crime was exposing those abuses, not the abuses themselves. And so the industry has you know, been working harder to you know, lock its doors tighter, close its windows, keep those curtains shut so that people don't see what's happening. And that's what has propelled us to ensure that we do still go inside with hidden cameras and get that footage out there. Yeah, I, I don't think most people who, you know, ha haven't really jumped into this and, and kind of gotten into the, the rabbit hole of, of watching all these footage, all these videos and kind of looking at the politics of it, really realize what an outlier the investigations really are, right? I mean, we all grow up hearing industry messaging you know, as much as we, we don't really even necessarily realize it, 
the vast majority of the dollars that are going, just advertising budget alone, right, for any of these large media or, or large um, meat companies, um, absolutely dwarf the entire budget of all of the animal advocacy nonprofits out there, right? So we, we live and we've all grown up in an environment where most of the speakers who are talking to us about these animals and about these issues are doing it to sell us more animal products, right? They're, they're trying to get us to forget that these are bodies of animals that were alive. Yeah. And that did not want, you know, to be, to be killed and to be, you know, put in cages and mutilated, et cetera. Right. So our, the fact that we're able to go in and, and kind of break that open by being the counterpoint to that kind of industry speech is very threatening mm -hmm. to the industry. So, you know, I think it's really, really important and vital that we do it. I think it, it, provides, you know, a public services, again, as, as people's initial reactions, I don't want to watch it, it's too violent, but you have to think about, you know, what went into getting it, how unusual it is that, you know, there that this is even available to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it always really blows my mind to think about the fact that these investigations are done by a few people. I say, you know, like, I say, well, I could have all the investigators who are out there doing investigations right now over to dinner at my house, and I do not have a big house, right? <laughs> like, meanwhile, the industry is spending millions of dollars in huge PR campaigns to actually legislate on these issues yeah. um, because it is such a, a departure from the, the norm, the system that they've built that is so opaque, that is so inaccessible, and they control all of the speaking aside from you know this kind of stuff so yeah I, this small yeah. minority exposing what's happening and um and and it's so shocking and so unexpected in many ways that it's that small minority of, of voices and video um is it speaks volumes yeah yeah and i think that's where like to me um I really feel kind of a duty to to get those images out there, to get the stories told, and to connect with people because I think people do care about animals. You know, we live in a society where we we care about animals. You know, and it's not just um, you know that crazy cat lady, right? <laughs> it's not just a few people. Um, and in fact, it is entrenched in our in our laws, the way the laws are written. The problem is that the industry has really co opted. Um, you know, the, the influence there is just so yeah. outsized for, for that industry. And I think investigations are just the best sort of way of, you know, expressing dissent and sort of exposing that truth. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's jump into another one. So let's okay. talk about um, quality pork processors. So this is a high <laughs> speed pork slaughterhouse. And I had a, a, just a whole bunch of issues that came into it, but it's also kind of been kept alive in some, you know, further years later, still being used to kind of push on um, making systemic change. So what do you remember about that? Yeah. yeah, so Quality Pork Processors is a, a large pig slaughterhouse in uh, Minnesota, and it is an exclusive supplier to Hormel. And when our investigator was working there, I remember, you know, seeing footage and getting some details about what was going on. And, um, you know, some of the, you know, the, the investigator was also able to record some of the conversations with mm -hmm. other employees or managers there. And there were some conversations that kept coming up about, you know, oh, if the USDA was here, they would shut us down. Like, oh, if they you know, saw what was really going on. Um, and, and it, I think that's when we really started, you know, to realize that this facility is a little bit different than other facilities. This is a facility that is operating under a pilot program through mm -hmm. the U.S. Department of Ag Agriculture, the USDA, that was essentially reducing the number of government trained inspectors inside the facility and handing some of that inspection duty over to slaughterhouse employees so there were just fewer usda around so that's yeah. where the comments were coming in and and not only that they were able they were allowed to run this the kill line even faster than in a regular slaughterhouse which is already mm -hmm. you know, an incredibly fast pace and so you know we started to 
really understand the impact of this investigation. This was a flagship of this um, high speed slaughter program uh, for the US Department of Agriculture. And we just documented, you know, what we would have expected in a pig slaughterhouse, but I think it was even worse than we would have expected because mm -hmm. everything was just, they were just trying to run at a much faster pace because this was that in that pilot program. And so we just saw pigs, you know, who couldn't walk being pulled and yanked and dragged to the slaughter line. And, um, you know, in one case, you know, there, there appears to be evidence of a, of a pig who went through the slaughter system and was still alive. Like mm -hmm. they are still, they're, they're heading down to the area where their bodies will be boiled to get their skin off and, um, or their hair off. And that, the pig is still moving around. And so, you know, we saw a lot of potential food safety violations. I mean, it was just some really gross footage even after slaughter. And, um, and that, you know, that investigation was, I think it was so powerful, um, not just because of the, the footage itself, but the story that it was part of this USDA flagship program, like the mm -hmm. USDA is mm -hmm. touting what a great place this is under this new pilot program. And there had been so much work that we were just starting to discover that had been done in so many other um, factors uh, or sectors of um, challenging these massive systems. That was food safety. There was a lot of food safety studies and work behind what happens in these high school water programs and worker rights issues. And there was so much work that had already been done, including USDA inspectors who did work inside that plant and other high speed slaughterhouses um, that were in part of that pilot program speaking out against the USDA's pilot program. And so we, you know, we ended up discovering that there was this whole um, campaign really to stop this high speed slaughter program. And this investigation um, really lent so much additional credibility to that campaign because it's the first time that this sort of raw day-to-day -day interaction of what's really going on inside this high-speed slaughterhouse um, was documented. And we ended up being part of this much wider campaign to put an end to this program for animal protection, for worker safety rights, as well as food safety concerns. Yeah, I think this investigation was such a, an important tool for that broad coalition and building, you know, a, a group of sort of opposition to the expansion of that high speed system. I mean, that high speed program really is a deregulation program. So after yeah. all this time we spent, you know, getting yeah. into factory farms and slaughterhouses and seeing how bad things are and how few people are aware of what's going on and the ones who are aware aren't enforcing the law. Now what the what the federal government is doing is just further handing the reins over to the <laughs> to the companies themselves to just, yeah. you know, police themselves. Um, and, you know, I think, like I said, this, this case sort of still has life, this investigation still has life because we have this ongoing lawsuit and there's, you know, a number of parties from different points of view that are involved and, um, you know, the, the expansion of that program nationwide stands to cause 11 and a half million more pigs to be run through that system under, you know, even in even regular slaughterhouses are absolutely horrifying. <laughs> this is yeah. like, you know, another level entirely. Um, and you're talking about so many more animals. So this really has become a very important tool um, to kind of to stave that off, um, yeah. you know, which I hope I hope is a successful effort. So let's talk a little bit about um, something a little different for us, which was fish. So we did this aquaculture investigation and um, that was the first aquaculture investigation in the US um, and it was, we had no idea what we were gonna, you know, unlike every other investigation where I think we kind of, you know, we did, we've done a ton of egg investigations. We've done a ton of investigations of, you know, dairy or, or pigs or whatever, yeah. but this was sort of like, well, what is this industry all about? What is going on? And um, what sort of surprised you or didn't surprise you in that investigation? Yeah, I mean, I think that aquaculture is something that's still, you know, not as well known um, in sort of like the, the the food world. It's mm -hmm. something I think is gaining traction. It's it's being touted as a solution to the depletion of oceans of wild caught fish, which is because of humans capturing all of yeah. them and destroying the oceans. And so it's 
it's, you know, some people are touting it as a sustainable way to still get, you know, all the nutrients from fish that we need in order to eat them. And what it really does in reality, though, is it puts fish in these horrific underwater tanks. I mean, they're just <laughs> cages. It's just a factory farm for fish. And, yeah. you know, they're breeding them and they're given tons of antibiotics because they need to fight off all this disease and, and you know, ailments and illnesses. And um, the fish don't have enough space. In a lot of these places, they have to still catch wild fish to feed to the yes. captured fish. Yeah. So it, yes. it doesn't, I mean, the whole system, I think, is, you know, it's just animal agribusiness's way of continuing to make profit and spin a story that is simply, you know, out of control and, and not based in a whole lot of reality. And, you know, the, the footage, just like any factory farm um, that we've, our slaughterhouse that we've gone into, I mean, this footage is just documenting how these animals are treated like widgets. They're just treated yeah. like meat producing machines. Um, and, you know, the fish are being thrown and tossed and slammed and st on the ground and stepped on and, you know, just treated as if they have absolutely no um, awareness, no sensibility to pain. Uh, as if they're not individual animals at all. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, what really stands out about the aquaculture, I mean, there's there's always sort of the idea that do people even really realize that fish feel pain? I mean, that really isn't a debate within the scientific community. Like, it's clear that fish do feel pain. It's more a question of people saying like, oh, yeah, you know, I never really thought about it kind of thing. But just as, as we have found in other animal ag industry, um, investigations, there's, you know, there's over cruelty in this, there's, you know, systematic cruelty. The, yeah. the thing that really kind of was so interesting to me in that investigation um, is it seemed like they didn't really like know what they were doing. Things weren't like standardized. So there's so many animals in a tank and there's situations like they weren't being fed enough. So the fish were eating each other's eyes because they thought that they were food, you know? I mean, the, and the number of animals is just so mind blowing that uh, uh, one sort of sloppy or, you know, um, intentionally kind of ignored issue like that can have such an impact on so many animals. And I think, you know, it's just something I, I just wanna kind of think about for the future because the aquaculture industry is growing very quickly. And I think yeah. we all need to be aware of what what is likely to be happening there and what we should be doing as advocates or as people who care about animals in any way to really educate ourselves about what that what that future looks like and try to get involved in kind of stopping and turning things around because otherwise you know th those numbers will dwarf you know the other the other animals that we're trying to protect as well yeah i mean and that's a really you know i think an interesting um perspective too is that we have no idea how many fish are killed for food. Mm -hmm. um, the US Department of Agriculture tracks land animals. So we know how many cows are slaughtered, we know how many pigs are slaughtered, but we have, they don't count animals or the fish as indiv individual animals. They count by their weight. Yeah. So we have absolutely no idea today or yesterday or tomorrow how many fish are being killed for food. They're not counted as individuals. Yeah, they measure them in tons, which I think yeah. that says a lot. Yeah. So let's end on dairy. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about dairy. And, and because it was the same investigator who did both our Martin Farms investigation and our Dick Van Dam dairy investigation, um, you know, I, I thought maybe we'd kind of lump them together a little bit for this purpose of conversation. But I think, you know, because these are some of our more recent investigations, um, it, it's really been on my mind a little bit to think about, you know, do, does mainstream America really get it with dairy? Are we getting there? We, there's so many, you know, plant-based alternative milk products. And, you know, we've always kind of said we're in this experiment where it's like, if people had a, you know, a practical alternative, if they really could understand like, yeah, I like this other food, this, this vegan version of whatever, you know, they'd be more open to, you know, kind of leaving the, the animal product version behind. And I think we have this real world kind of experiment playing out with us uh, when it comes to dairy, because it is just so horribly cruel. And there are, you know, the explosion in, in oat milk and soy milk and almond milk and everything else. Um, you know, so, so where do you see that? Like, what, do, what do you take out of the role of these dairy investigations and how it plays into, you know, 
really making progress against this industry and just in terms of sort of vegan values in general. Yeah, I, you know, I think of, of, of the different types of investigations that we've done, I think that that people have a easier time relating to cows than they do to chicken or fish for chickens or fish, for example. So, you know, I think cow investigations um, do draw in a lot more attention in some ways, I think because people, you know, they're sort of like just big dogs mm -hmm. and people start to see that when, when you're allowed to see cows living out their, you know, lives as they should, you realize they're just very big dogs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these dairy cow investigations, I think, are also compelling because we've been marketed that milk is just so natural for us to consume. And there's it's an it's just a natural product. And then you see what's really happening, that these cows are impregnated over and over in order to produce milk. They give birth, their babies are taken away, they're impregnated again. And in in that process, they're also, you know, they're treated like milk producing machines and they are kicked and shoved, their tails are twisted to get them to move. Um, I mean, the, the impregnation process alone is yeah. horrific and shocking. They are artificially inseminated, which involves someone inseminating them. And we have footage of it, and it is that alone is horrible to watch. Um, and their lives are just, you know, milked several times a day and you know, they are, they're bred to produce abnormally large quantities of milk, which mm -hmm. often causes calcium depletion in their bodies, which, you know, that's what causes a lot of their leg injuries, making it hard for them to walk around. They're not given, you know, freedom to exercise as they should. And so they just, they, they just live these very boring, barren lives um, where their babies are just taken away upon birth. And, you know, they're, 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 they give birth after nine months of pregnancy, just like a human does. Mm -hmm. And their babies are taken away usually in the first or maybe second day. And, you know, we've heard reports of farms, you know, in which babies are taken away and, you know, neighbors towns away can hear the bellowing and yeah. mother cows are running after, you know, however they can, if they can run after their babies who are being carted off because they can't even walk yet. Um, and so, you know, it's, I think once people start to see what's happening inside a dairy factory farm, they start to, I think really that's part of the unraveling of the myth that big ag is trying to feed us, that we should be consuming milk and what happens on these farms is it, it's like old McDonald's farms. It's basically yeah, yeah. taking old McDonald's farm and just flipping it on its head. And, and I think that's a lot of what our investigations have helped um, bring that narration to a growing number of consumers who are just outraged when they see it. Yeah, yeah, I think there's something uniquely violent about dairy too. Like in addition to some of these things that are more like sort of um, suffering and deprivation, you know, like taking the babies away and, you know, having nowhere to go all day, you know, like yeah. that kind of thing. But there's so much just overt violence in dairy, you know, the the hitting, the kicking, the the hot iron disc budding where they're, they're, you know, trying to move their face and they can't move their face and they're, you know, kicking their legs to try to get away. And, you know, the, the violence that even goes into just getting them into a truck, getting them to a slaughterhouse, you know, I think dairy to me, um, is a real entry issue for people, especially because, you know, you can get oat milk at Starbucks, you know what I mean? Like there are yeah. things that, um, to me, dairy has a real um, accessibility to people that maybe some of these other industries are, are yeah. not as, it's not as clear like what the issues are. So yeah. I think that's And I think that dairy is considered, I mean, just generally because the cows, are alive, right? They have to be alive to to collect their milk. That it's not considered generally as violent of an industry as, let's say, you know, killing pigs for food. But when you see what's really happening, you realize that their lives are misery filled day in yeah. and day out, and they are slaughter. They are still sent to slaughter at a, at a for for you know at a young age. They're usually about four or five or six, and that's you know Central Valley meat then helps. So, you know, you can see the whole life cycle of yep. these animals. Central Valley meat is where they end up going. And it is a horrible death, just like their lives have been horrible. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a really, I mean, they're kept alive longer than other farmed animals. And yeah. then, you know, they're kind of, it's very violent. So yeah, I, I mean, I have a lot of hope for um, kind of the power of the dairy story to bring people into these issues. And I think especially seeing the media coverage around our most recent investigation that was dairy and some of the conversations that that started, I think this really may be our way to kind of turn the corner into, um, you know, people people having a more sophisticated awareness and more empowerment to sort of change their their behavior around that. Yeah. So, um, you know, this has been, I actually, I love talking about this topic. I know that sounds sort of strange, <laughs> but it's so, to me, it's so fascinating. There's so much to it. I really, you know, just am absolutely in awe of what the investigators are able to do and the amount of sort of self-sacrifice that goes into that and the hard work that they put into that. So I really feel like the more we're able to you know, engage in these topics, you know, the, the, the better I feel about kind of the impact that we're able to make. But um, do you want to close us out with one kind of takeaway point about why people should, you know, engage with investigations, watch investigations, share investigations, and what the role is, you know, in the next 15, 16 years for the for this kind of work? Yeah, I mean, the you know, I think investigations are really what fuels our entire farm animal advocacy movement. So it's, it goes so far beyond the work that we do. And I think that's, you know, one of the, the major contributions um, to, to changing the world overall is um, by providing sort of this factual documentation of, uh, of what's happening when the industry doesn't think anybody is paying attention. Uh, you know, and and there's so much, I think, to be learned from these investigations, as horrible as they are to watch. Um, you know, I think is the bigger question is, if it's something so difficult to watch, is it something that you want to support? Yeah. And, and that idea that we don't need meat to survive. In fact, meat, milk or eggs to survive. In fact, so many studies show that we are healthier in many cases without consuming animal products. And you know, studies are showing that, you know, choosing a plant-based diet is better for the environment. And, you know, the, the factory farming system itself, you know, animal agribusiness, big ag, whatever you want to call it, it is built on a system of exploitation. It is exploiting everyone and everything in its path from the animals to the workers, to the environment, to the rural communities that they're usually in. And it, it's just built on this foundation of, of exploiting and causing harm for profit. And yeah. the whole system needs to be dismantled. I know a lot of people talk about this and that's that's why, because it's not just a bad place for animals. It's, it, it causes so much harm that is, you know, just beyond the immediate nature of what we're documenting, what's happening to the animals. Like, there is so much, um, you know, reverberating throughout the communities that they're in and the pollution that it's causing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, our goal is is to expose what's really happening and recognize that it's these are not bad apples. I mean, I think that's one thing the industry always wants to highlight is, oh, well, there was a worker who wasn't trained properly and did this wrong, or that one farm is just mm -hmm. not doing what they're supposed to. But there are just too many investigations, not just by us, but by other people corroborating the reality that cruelty is standard practice in this industry. And, um, and it, it it's just a bad system from from the setup and the get go. It, it is it is you know just I think shocking when you realize what's really happening because you grow up with old McDonald's farm stories, mm -hmm. and then when you start to see the reality, there's it's this reaction of like how like what you were saying earlier, like how can we be doing this? How is this okay? How who is allowing this? And then you have to ask the question of what are you doing to support it and how can you challenge it and change it? And that's what these undercover investigations are doing. They're challenging it and helping change it. Absolutely. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, this is, this is sort of a good moment to wrap up the whole series, which has been really fun for me. I don't know. I hope that it's, you know, it brings some historical context and some perspective and insight to the people who are watching. So thank you so much. And, um, you know, this is sort of the, the occasion for me to say thank you for everything. Um, and I hope that the next, um, you know, phase for the organization and the next phase for you 
um, you know, are sort of even better than the last. So thank yeah. you. Well, thank you. And I look forward to seeing all the future successes and, um, and victories achieved at Animal Outlook.